With EU4's new Domination DLC, most of the great powers of the world have been given a whole new mission tree and a few new mechanics to wrestle with. I've played lots of the Ottomans over on my stream, reaching for Mehmed's ambition, but here on YouTube I wanted to make something a little less sweaty. This is Castile. There was an extremely critical change made to Castile in the Domination patch which has radically altered how they play. The Castile mission tree now includes all of Spain's missions, even without forming Spain. I will not spoil why this is such a huge change, but just know that Castile now has the potential to do some pretty insane plays, which I'll be demonstrating in this series going age by age for Castile. With that, we're starting off in the Age of Discovery, which mostly remains the same for Castile, although I'll be showing you how to dominate large parts of Europe by 1500 as the rising Spanish kingdom, using a mixture of diplomacy and war. Let's get into it. Castile is, funnily enough, labeled as friendly for new players. In the past, this may have been true, but to be frank, Castile in today's EU4 is a mess of disasters and without proper planning, will fall behind nations like France and England pretty quickly. First of all, I'd recommend just restarting if Aragon rivals you. You definitely can play the game while rivaling Aragon, but it's just a huge pain and sets you back. I've been rivaled by England and France, which is pretty much perfect. I'm going to rival them back, and I'm going to rival Portugal because one of Castile's missions only gives you a restoration of Union CB if you don't get along with them. That and Portugal will be a useful tool for us to colonize the New World if we can get them in a Union. In Portugal's stead, my eternal ally will be Burgundy, who I'm definitely not becoming friends with in the hopes of inheriting their land via the Burgundian inheritance. On a more serious note, Burgundy is actually an amazing ally for fighting France, since they can pretty much 1v1 them in the early game. I'm also going to spy on Granada so I can get some claims. Time for estates, of course. I tend to be pretty conservative with my estates, not pushing my crown land down as hard as some people do, but in the case of Castile, it's actually a good idea, because we want to get rid of the locked privilege the nobility gets, which increases autonomy across the country. We'll need 50% crown land for that, so I'm only going to grant the admin point privilege to the clergy. Otherwise, I just grant a relatively standard set of privileges. Having high influence in the estates means as we conquer, we'll lose more and more crown land, but that's okay because I won't actually be conquering too much land myself. This is going to be a very vassal and union-heavy Castile. As well, I'll be using my monarch points very efficiently and having lots of points for development, which will also increase the crown land. Another note, you might be tempted to use the burghers' forced draft privilege since free heavy ships sound great. In the current patch of the game, heavy ships are broken and not in the good way. For whatever reason, heavy ships just kind of melt to light ships, and I'm sure it'll get fixed eventually, but for now, you're better off deleting all your heavies and running a navy of light ships for the open seas, galleys for the Mediterranean, and cogs for transport. For the record, this was fixed in the most recent hotfix, but at the time I recorded this footage, it was not fixed. In your runs, if you're on the current patch, you may want to use heavy ships again, but even then, they're expensive, and if you can make do with lights and galleys, good on you. Anyway, getting into the game, I'm going to hire some mercenaries because we don't have a huge manpower reserve, and we're about to have a civil war right off the bat. I grabbed the best goalie for that 5 shock 2 siege general, using the money I borrowed from the burghers and their sweet 1% loans. Oh, pro tip by the way, don't royal marry Aragon because we're going to disinherit Enrique in the hopes of getting a better heir. Instead, wait until you get an heir to do the marriage. If you marry and disinherit, Aragon will claim your throne and break your alliance. After some time passes, you'll get the first disaster for Castile, which presents you with two options. One appears to be way better than the other on the surface, but siding with the Infantes means you won't be able to get the Isabella event that gives you a great female monarch via an event. That means we'll be standing with the king, costing us stability and raising more rebels. I tried to move my units to where the rebels would be according to the event, but unfortunately, if you buffer the event by unpausing while it's still up, the provinces where the rebels rise up will change without telling you. During this disaster, you'll get a lot of negative events, so it's critical to finish this disaster as fast as possible. All you have to do is kill every rebel and get stability to zero. Unless you get super lucky, you'll probably have to just spend admin points on stability. It's worth it to get out of the disaster. I did get unlucky with one event that raised even more pretender rebels in my capital, but that's alright. We can live with some extra rebels. At least I got a pretty good heir, also an Enrique, but an actually good one. 12 points total is slightly above average, so I'm happy. I then married Aragon and realized they were excommunicated. You can consider breaking the alliance with them and just taking their promise with the excommunication CB if you're feeling spicy, but I don't recommend it. Having to spend all those admin points on coring when you're already barely keeping yourself out of disasters and the Congress of Granada is coming up is just way too painful. I was hit by another bad event after raising my stability that would either cost me that stability or take admin and diplo points. I of course lost the points, leaving me in point debt. Anyway, I ended the disaster which gave me some legitimacy, crown land, and manpower. Great. Of course, right after this one, the next civil war immediately began ticking. Yes, this is a very new player friendly. Keep calm and protect trade with your light ships for a little extra income. As well, the Castilian Civil War will take some time to happen, so we're not going to sit around waiting for it. While it's ticking, Granada is quite vulnerable. It's possible that the Ottomans can ally them, although I haven't seen it in the Domination patch yet. 
If that happens, well, you're kind of screwed. If Granada allies Morocco or Tunis, you can try attacking them to isolate Granada, but quite frankly, with how early in the run we are, just restart if Granada allies the Ottomans. Oh, by the way, in my run, Burgundy's Duke died early and I got a member of my dynasty on their throne. This is actually a bad thing because now the Burgundian inheritance will not happen. It's still something to have a shared family with the Burgundians, but I'd have preferred gambling on the Burgundian inheritance. I can't take advantage of this shared dynasty for now, since the aggressive expansion of claiming a throne that massive would get me killed, but later on we can do it, assuming they don't lose the dynasty at some point. I got a free stability point randomly, which let me complete the Infantes of Aragon mission. This actually is extremely good because it means the current king, Juan, will get enough monarch points to no longer allow the Castilian Civil War to tick. The disaster is still active, but it can't gain progress while our king's points exceed a certain level. This means that if we keep ourselves under a skilled enough king, we won't have to do the Castilian Civil War. This mission does give a restoration of Union CB on Aragon, but I won't be using it, since we'll get an event to just get Aragon for free in the near future. Anyway, it's time to go to war with Granada, bringing us to the Morisco era of Castile. I managed to fabricate three claims, but I'm not bothering to wait for the fourth one. They're allied to Morocco and Tunis, but Tunis isn't joining the war. Well, they weren't, but I marked Morocco as a co-belligerent, and turns out Morocco and Tunis were allied, so Tunis rejected Granada's call to arms, then accepted Morocco's, meaning I was fighting all three. That's fine though, I think I can take all three by just holding the Gibraltar choke point. I tried to get naval supremacy, but it's tough to beat Morocco, Tunis, and Granada's navy. I'd occasionally pop out if I saw a small navy lurking and sink a few vessels, promptly retreating back into Sevilla. To be honest, it was a waste of ships to do this. I can't possibly rest naval supremacy here, so I'm just kind of throwing away ships doing this. At one point, I decided to get military access from Portugal to bait the Maghrebis into crossing, but then Morocco started landing troops in Portugal to walk into my land, presumably. The AI actually managed to bait me into leaving Gibraltar to confront their men in Portugal. This let them move into Gibraltar uncontested, and I realized I actually was outplayed by a Paradox game AI. Damn you and your manipulative tactics, Morocco. Now that they have the defensive mountains of Gibraltar on their side, I had to bring in my secret weapon to save me. Aragon. I'm sort of memeing around here, but losing that battle cost me a ton of manpower, which really sucks. I should have just called in Aragon to begin with, but whatever. I'm having fun with this actually interesting war. Thankfully, the Moroccans did not fight my army in Malaga, instead allowing the siege to go on uncontested. Oh, I also wasn't paying attention and got my navy destroyed. That's painful. Let this be a lesson though, that even with setbacks, EU4 is a game you can still win, although none of this is at all optimal. With Aragon's support, the Moroccans were pushed out of Iberia, and in fact, I was able to work with Aragon's navy to get control of the sea. Well, I did for a few moments anyway. I now have 8 ships left. Man, those burger loans are really coming in handy, eh? Turns out Aragon was going to entirely carry me in this war, as they sent in their navy to actually control the Straits of Gibraltar, and then we crossed into North Africa. My plan is to take a solid chunk out of Morocco, particularly their mountain fort of Fez, so I can defang them and conquer the rest later. With Aragon's support and a tech advantage at the last moment, the Moors fell apart. With some smart blockades, I got Tunis out of the war, and now I had free reign in Morocco and Andalusia. In order to mitigate some aggressive expansion, I'm going to give a few provinces to Aragon, since I know I'll be making them a subject in the near future anyway. I actually had an opportunity to piece out Granada for 100 war score to get everything I wanted, but truce timers are based on how much war score was demanded, so I didn't want to get a 100 war score length truce with Morocco if I could avoid it. That being said, I also didn't want to be locked in this war, so ultimately, I did take Granada's deal, securing North Africa and Andalusia in one war. I had an inkling in the back of my head that Morocco wouldn't be around much longer, but I wasn't sure so I started coring and returned to normal. I had a theory in my mind that Morocco's vassals would revolt and fully annex the country, leaving Morocco gone. I could then release Morocco and give them back all these cores, meaning I didn't even need to core anything in North Africa, but at the same time, I wasn't sure it had happened, so I instead began the coring process like normal. Anyway. Al-Andalus is reclaimed, and another mission is complete. I highly recommend expelling the Moriscos, because if you don't, you'll get events where they try to rebel against you later. It costs a stability point, but it's not so bad. It does convert their religion, which is extremely convenient. Religiously tolerant Castile sucks in comparison to Spanish Inquisition Castile. Anyway, it's 1452, and those are Castile's opening moves. In 8 years, we moved into North Africa, prevented horrific civil war, allied to Burgundy and Aragon, and got a bit lucky with a diet to conquer a bit of France. Now that's interesting, and brings us to the next section of Castile's story in the Age of Discovery. Where normally Castile is treated as a colonial power, there's no reason why Castile, with Burgundy and Aragon to help, can't just destroy France early on. One thing to note about powers like France, or even the Ottomans, is that their strength is in their ability to gain power, as opposed to their actual starting power. This isn't to say France or the Ottomans aren't immensely powerful, but hamstringing them early on is the best way to ensure they won't become a bigger problem. That's why the second I got the Diet to invade Gascony, I jumped on it, calling Burgundy in with favors. 
France's only ally, Switzerland, refused their call to arms, meaning it was just me and Burgundy against France and its appanages. This would be easy. My plan was to mostly hang back and let Burgundy do all the fighting in the north, while I slowly occupy things in the south. With only 4,000 manpower, I don't have any men to throw away into a French meat grinder. At the same time, I noticed that Morocco was getting occupied, and immediately I knew Morocco was going to get fully annexed by Marrakesh. I cancelled my cores, and at least got some admin points back, but indeed, my choice to begin the cores and progress them quite a bit meant to be wasting some points. It's fine. My plan is to release Morocco as a vassal after this war with France and then reconquer all their territory to make a basically free vassal North Africa who I can just divert trade from. Back to France. This war is basically just me sieging casually in Occitania, while the Burgundians handle the actual difficult part of the war. The rebellious duke has a lot of forts that are going to hold off the French army, and Burgundy is just strong enough to be able to challenge most French armies, but they'll probably end up with a stalemate leading towards France. I have to win the war before Burgundy ends up losing their close battle with the French, or I have to come in and help fight the French to give Burgundy the edge they need to win the war for me. In this war I did a bit of both. Not looking to waste manpower, I did allow Burgundy to mostly deal with France, but once I broke through Poitou and Auvergne, I started fighting French armies where I had overwhelming numbers and could win without much death on my side. Also, I got Isabelle as my new heir. This event is why earlier we chose the harder civil war. If you take the easier outcome for the civil war, you will not get Isabelle, and she's way too good to pass up. If you get this event and your heir is actually better than a 563, you can just get a bunch of monarch points from this event. So it's great no matter what you've got going on, although I'd recommend getting Isabelle if only for roleplaying purposes, let alone how good she is. It was also during this war that I got a very important event as Castile, the Iberian Wedding. This event appears either if the monarchs of Aragon and Castile are of opposite genders, or if Aragon is the regency and the player is Castile, or vice versa, since Aragon can also get the Iberian Wedding on Castile if Aragon is played by a human. This event lets us freely gain a personal union on Aragon at the cost of a few rebels back home. It's always worth it, never choose the other option. This also means Aragon is now in the war with France, so our victory is assured. Not to say victory wasn't already assured, my forces along with Burgundy just took Paris. Burgundy actually has a mission where if they take Paris, they can steal all of France's appanages, but I think they didn't progress on the tree enough to get it, so they did not steal France's subjects, unfortunately. Anyway, France has been defeated, but I don't want to take too much stuff off of them, since my plan is to mostly release vassals and feed them pieces from France, rather than conquering it myself. I took the entire western coast up to Brittany, I'm going to release Gascony, who has a ton of cores on South France, as well as Morocco, as I mentioned earlier. I'm going to grab the strong Duchy's privilege too, to avoid losing double points from being over my relations limit. The reason I grabbed the western coast from France was just for access to Brittany, but I ended up getting sidetracked by other things and not paying much attention to Brittany in this run. You can definitely conquer Brittany here and then jump into England if you want to from there. Looking back to Iberia, I can complete the claims in Aragon mission. Because I'm not friends with Portugal, this gives me a restoration of Union War against them. This is great, because Portugal is an extremely powerful colonial nation, and if I can put them in a union, all their colonies will basically be my colonies. I'm planning to mostly focus on Europe this run, so letting Portugal handle the new world for me is great. Not to mention, Portugal's army is a little something which could help us in other wars. I was able to fully occupy Portugal easily, but I was waiting a bit to end the war until they took exploration ideas. In previous patches, it was the case that if Portugal, or Castile, or any colonial power became a subject, they would never pick exploration or expansion ideas. I later learned that Portugal is hardwired to take those ideas even if they become a subject, so that no longer applies. I wasted my time by waiting here, but it's okay. I'm still absolutely dominating the game right now, even with little mistakes. In 1458, I made a union with Portugal, and now I've got all of Iberia under my control. Wonderful. I can do the mission that gives me a claim to Austria, but I'm not ready to fight them yet, so I'll not be doing this mission. I can click it whenever I'm ready, so I'm just going to hold on to it until I am ready. I also have a claim to Naples, but they're allied to Austria, and I'll be completely honest. I was being a coward and feared Austria, even though I had no reason to. I literally can absolutely crush Austria and Naples alone, but I have a flaw as an EU4 player, and that is passivity. Learn from my mistakes here, and understand that you are more powerful than you realize. You can do it, viewer. In the meantime, I focused on North Africa, declaring war on Tlemcen. Not much to say about that war. What was important about this war was that during it, I noticed Provence was willing to become a vassal. That's huge for me because Provence has cores on France and they have a pretty good mission tree, although I don't plan to use it in this run. The cores on France alone are worth it though. Anyway, I'm going to partition Tlemcen between Morocco and Aragon, giving the western half to Morocco since they have cores on it, and the coastline to Aragon since they have claims on it. By doing it this way, they spend the admin points instead of me. It was also at this point that I got my first idea group. I was thinking about quantity, admin, or influence, since I could use quantity to just make a massive army and be on custom power, or I could use admin to conquer lots of land without spending too much on cores, but I decided on influence because doing a pretty vassal heavy run here, 
and the points I'll save with the reduction to annexation costs are well worth it. From here, I mostly chilled and waited until my troops to France was up. I definitely could have gone in and enforced a PU on Naples, but I was being a bit passive. In your game, go ahead and get into Italy. I instead drilled for the duration of the French truce, since only professionals would unlock Tertios later via Castile's mission tree. I also was checking out some of the new holy orders you can put in states as an Iberian. One of them just gives flat institution spread, which I think is probably something I'm overvaluing, but being able to get any institution, no matter where it spawns, to start spreading in your capital state is pretty nice in my opinion. Anyway, the France truce was up, so I went for Gascony's cores. It went the same way as last war, with Burgundy fighting most of the war and me just sieging in the south. I'm choosing to take all of France's money as well in each of these wars because I really want to set them back, and one of the best ways to weaken an AI in the long term is to steal their money. This puts them in debt and gives them less money to rebuild their armies after you win the war. It also puts me ahead since I can get a solid chunk of change out of the war. I was looking at Provence and it looks like they lost Anjou, so the distance between us is a bit larger. I could still vassalize them if I get some diplomatic reputation, which influence ideas will give me, and by gaining trust, which I can use my favors with them for. If I don't plan to ever call Provence into wars, I'll just trade all my favors for trust. While working on that, I decided to go after Morocco's cores, and I even gave them all the land in the region that wasn't their core just to solidify my rule in the area. These wars were uneventful. I was looking around Italy, and I realized I had quite the opportunity there. One scary thing about conquering Italy is how high the aggressive expansion is there. Considering the development of the area and a lack of releasable tags with cores, France is easy to conquer because you can just vassal feed huge tags, but the only big tag in Italy is basically Naples and that's all. With how high my diplomatic reputation is and how vast my empire has become, I can actually vassalize many of the smaller states in Italy. I'm going to use that to avoid taking too much aggressive expansion in the area. Speaking of Naples, Austria wasn't willing to support Naples, and with that, my fear to take them over was gone. I immediately declared a war, even while I was still at war with Sus. Fighting just Naples and Florence, it was a stomp, of course. I went into a lot of detail for the early wars because they were actually interesting, but these wars are just a single stack wipe and then splitting the army to carpet siege. The nice thing about getting Naples is that now we have a smaller distance between border penalty to vassalize the smaller Italian countries, and I got my eyes on Ferrara right now. Ferrara has claims to Mantua, and we're going to use them to go to war with North Italy. Thus begins the Italian conquests, which are mostly done by proxy. With all these unions and vassals, we can basically just be hands off and let them do the war. I'm helping to move things along faster, but I generally don't have to if I want to be lazy. I was thinking about going sicko mode and just conquering Milan so I co to them, but now nah, I'm just going to at least parma me vassalize and I'll bide my time. I hit the next idea group, and I decided to go with quality so I could be even more hands off. In most cases, more men is a better way to fight, but if you're lazy, better men means you don't have to think about battles as much. You can just send troops in to win battles, ignoring terrain penalties and numerical differences. I'm now attacking the other smaller Italian powers and handing out land to my vassals and to Naples according to their claims. Bologna goes to Ferrara and the Papal States go to Naples. November of 1479, I've got a pretty solid chunk of land here, with Portugal expanding it off the New World in the Terra Incognita through their colonies. Now it's time to focus on making some big money using these vassals. It just keeps getting better for me, as Milan was invaded by Savoy and now I can vassalize Milan, who I was just at war with. They of course have cores on Savoy that I can use to get a pretty nice chunk of land for almost no aggressive expansion. I can even vassalize Genoa. This is largely in part to my big army and my diplomatic reputation. Each level of Diplo rep gives three reasons for a country to accept vassalization, and that might not sound like a lot, but you can get a solid chunk of reputation through the papal interaction, an advisor, idea groups, and national ideas to make Italy more or less free. With control over much of the Genoa trade node, I can transfer trade power from my vassals and collect in Genoa. This will hugely increase my income, given how much money is on the trade node. Later, I'll be collecting in Venice too, but I need a little more land over there first. France and Savoy were allied, so I decided to attack France, making Savoy a co-belligerent. I'm going to return Provence's cores from France and Milan's cores from Savoy. Venice was also in this war, although I didn't have any plans for them yet besides just separating them from France, so I can attack them from Milan's cores later too. The rest of the world was just stomping all over France and obtaining all the cores I needed. I'm basically out of manpower now, so we're going to war for a bit. I'm instead going to spend some time integrating the various tiny vassals I have to save some diplomatic relation slots and to increase my own power. First was Parma and then Ferrara. From there, I started integrating Morocco before declaring war on Florence once I had 17 manpower. Finally, enough men for an all-out war. Wahibi was allied to Florence, but they were easy to take down. I annexed Florence directly, and because all of my recent conquests have been reconquests, the aggressive expansion for taking Florence is negligible. 
After the war, I noticed that France was completely occupied, and I don't know what war that was supposed to be, but I figured I'd jump in for Milan's cores. I'm annexing Milan, but there's no way I'll be done before I can get Milan their cores back. At this point, my aggressive expansion will probably just creep up to taking Florence like that, so with Venice, I'll have to be a bit conservative. Once Venice's war with Hungary was over, they lost a lot of land, but none of that land belonged to Milan, so I didn't care. In fact, Trent gained some land, and I can vassalize them, so that's just bonus land for me. Even better, off in the Alps, Piedmont took a bunch of land from Savoy, while remaining small enough for me to vassalize too. Italy is just feeding their land to me, and I'm all for it. There was one anomaly on the peninsula though, the Ottomans. The provinces of Urbino and Ravenna have been taken by the Ottomans, and that was a problem, given the Ottoman strength. I was at a crossroads now. I wanted to invade England, on whom I had claims thanks to my missions, but I also wanted to focus on taking the Ottomans down before they could get too strong. I decided on a sort of compromise. I would build up my navy to invade England, but before invading, I'd attack the Ottomans and kick them out of Italy at least. And so, with some time spent on recovering manpower, I began the first war with the Ottomans to remove them from Italy in 1499. This would be a scary war, but I was confident I'd come out on top by just holding the war goal and fighting clearly winning battles wherever possible. The first battle to ensue for this war was a naval one, and my god, I was completely destroyed. My trade fleet was annihilated and my flagship was sunk. My galleys and cogs were defeated, and that was definitely a harrowing beginning. On a positive note, I held the war goal in Italy, and the Ottomans had a few forts to get through in the Alps to reach the war goal themselves. The first land battle in Brescia went quite well, with Valeriano de Cordoba winning a battle against a leaderless Ottoman army, inflicting heavy casualties. Okay, that's one battle. Let's see how the others go. The next army to brave Brescia was larger and had a three-star general. Okay, that's a little more intimidating. I upped the ante myself and put together a 45,000 man strong squad, ready to take the Ottomans down once again. Although not as decisive as the previous battle, this one would also go in my favor, thankfully. During the war, I was able to complete the System of Councils mission, giving me a new government reform, which is unique to Castile. The System of Councils gives you the ability to revoke privileges even without enough loyalty to do so normally, which I immediately used to get rid of the nobility's factionalism. The big bonus of the System of Councils government is first off, the extra two diplomatic relations, and more importantly, the extra admin monarch power. Beyond that even, is the Council Consensus mechanic, which is a bar that gains progress based on your monarch's abilities. If the bar is full, you get administrative efficiency, which decreases core costs and reduces overextension. You can also spend half the bar to call a meeting, which gives one of nine modifiers, three per monarch point type, and it also gives you one extra monthly monarch point of the related type. The modifiers you can get are actually pretty good, especially the extra army tradition, the diplomatic reputation, or the missionary missionary strength. This reform is honestly pretty amazing to have, and I'd recommend making good use of it. That extra diplomatic reputation would let us, theoretically, vassalize even more nations, although there aren't many left outside of the Holy Roman Empire to get. Anyway, back to the Ottoman War, it turns out that my subjects had managed to actually occupy Ankara and were working towards Constantinople. I was quite impressed by that, but it looks like the Ottomans are coming around to deal with them. With that, I decided that I wanted to end the war. I had more than enough war score to get the two Italian provinces and about 2,000 ducats. I doubt this will hamstring the Ottomans, but it'll certainly embarrass them a bit. One thing to keep in mind is that the Ottomans gain decadence whenever they lose a war, but that decadence won't matter in this age because they have a modifier that constantly reduces decadence. That modifier gets smaller in the Age of Reformation and eventually flips to being an increasing decadence modifier in later ages. I vassalized Trent right after and then was called into war by the Burgundians. I accepted only because I wanted to keep the alliance, but I don't plan to help out in their war in Switzerland. I figured that if the Burgundians want my help, I can ask them for their help, so I declared war on France to take some of Provence's claims, which they got via a mission. This war will not be reconquest, but it'll at least be some claims from my vassal. What more do you want me to say? France is no longer an actual threat. With how much land they've lost, I was able to completely dominate them, and I took the remaining parts of Occitania from France for Provence, and I took the rest of Poitou for myself. Taking this much land will form a tiny coalition of mostly irrelevant minor nations. I'm okay with that though, since they won't be strong enough to bother me yet. Burgundy called me to another war against Lorraine afterwards, which I again accepted. I started to think about what I should do with Burgundy, who I was hoping to put into a personal union through the Burgundian inheritance. I'll probably break my alliance in the near future, but keep friendly relations so I can claim their throne, and then force a personal union. Putting a union over Burgundy would give me an immense amount of gross expansion, so I'm waiting until I've dealt with the Holy Roman Empire to do that. In the meantime, my ideas give me a colonist, so I sent him out to Tuat to connect me to Sub-Saharan Africa, which I might make use of later in the future. Skipping forward a bit to 1511, I'm going to complete my conquest of Italy by taking Venice. I've vassalized and integrated the rest of Italy, except Trent, and all that remains is Venice. I'm leaving Rome to the Pope because of the Spanish monarchy, we of course have to respect the Holy Father. Although I didn't have claims to most of Venice's land, I simply took the entire state. 
I didn't want to fight Venice again if I didn't need to. This meant that I was now attracting an actually somewhat large coalition. No did they know that I have no fear of their tiny armies. With my quality ideas, powerful subjects, and massive economic power, I knew that no one could realistically step to me, except perhaps the Ottomans, who were not at all upset with my aggressive expansion as they are not Christians. Remember that aggressive expansion mostly affects people of the same religion as the nation you're conquering. With the conquest of Venice, I am now an empire whose imperial grace only rivaled by the Holy Roman Empire. That's going to be the next major obstacle for Castile, given that we want to eventually get into the Netherlands. We can't really do that efficiently if the Holy Roman Empire is always getting in the way. There are lots of ways to handle the Empire, generally speaking. You can always just ally all the electors and go to war with the Emperor, but I kinda wanna draw out this conflict for the sake of drama. Forgive me, but as a CK3 player, sometimes I like to intentionally do things wrong to make the game more interesting. If you're looking for a guide-style piece of advice, the Holy Roman Empire can always be taken down by just allying every elector and then occupying Vienna, assuming Austria is still the Emperor. If you do that, you can hit the Dismantle Empire button, and that's the end of the Empire. Quite easy. What I'm going to do is pick apart the Empire like a vulture over a corpse. I have so much diplomatic reputation that I can vassalize some princes. Check out Württemberg here. They're a relatively large Swabian prince, and I don't even border them, but I can vassalize them anyway. When I vassalize them, it'll give me a foothold in the Empire that will make every other prince more likely to accept my vassalization offers. For this next bit of time, I'm going to focus on vassalizing a couple little states in the Empire wherever I can. While I'm coaxing the princes into joining my better, stronger, and faster, I guess, Empire, I'm going to strengthen my economy. I control Italy in its entirety now, split with my subject Naples. I'm going to collect trade in Genoa and Venice. I have three merchants because I made all of Morocco a trade company. When a trade company is able to provide enough trade power to give you a majority of the trade share in the trade node, you get a merchant. I'm going to use that merchant to collect in Venice, alongside one of my base 2 merchants to collect in Genoa. I now collect in three nodes, Sevilla by default, Genoa, and Venice with merchants, shooting my trade income through the roof. After setting up my trade, I noticed that Austria actually lost the emperorship, which I don't think I was paying attention as I never noticed it. I decided it was too good of an opportunity not to invade. The new emperor, the Palatinate, was not going to help them, and I have a mission I haven't clicked all game, so I'm going to put Austria into a union. Only thing that's scary about this is that my queen Isabel is kind of old, so I'm going to have to rush to increase relations to stop the union from ending. As well, that aggressive expansion kind of runs counter to my plan to vassalize the empire, but I have pretty high improved relations, so I'm not concerned about it. This opinion about my expansion will disappear within about a decade or so. The only ally worth mentioning in this war is England. I'm not planning to do anything with them right now, but I want to use this war as a test against their navy, so I'm going to go for a landing in London. I have 81 ships, and England has about 30. I'm pretty sure I'll be fine. I managed to occupy London and get myself a solid 1000 ducats. It's clear to me that England will not be a problem to invade later. Anyway, Austria is now in my empire, meaning I could do another mission. Up next is the Fecho del Imperio mission, which gives a permanent diplomatic annexation cost modifier. Would have been nice to have that before. Also, the coalition is forming. I don't care though. I'm going to lay low for a bit and let the coalition slowly forget about me. In the meantime, I've got ambitions in Africa to look after, as the Age of Discovery comes to a close. I'm a bit late to the party, but Biafada is a nice province, as it gives me a board with West African Sultanates. While planning all that out, Burgundy called me into war against Gallery. I just ignored it. I'm focused on making Austria like me, since Isabel is super old. I barely managed to get their opinion above zero. Thanks to my improved relations modifier, Austria gains about 20 opinion of me each year, so it wasn't too hard, but I just threw money at them. I influenced, gifted, and subsidized them to increase opinion quickly. Isabel died quickly after, and I inherited Aragon. I actually kinda didn't want this because I don't have much governing capacity left, but free land is free land. This whole time, I've also been upgrading the monuments in Iberia. Both El Escorial and Alhambra, both of these monuments are really good, so throwing my money at them is nice. I can't max them out yet, but at least I can get them to level 2. You might be wondering why I'm not forming Spain by the way. If you're a bit new to the game, this is where some advanced strategies are going to come out. Spain is an endgame tag, which means once I form them, I can't form any other nation ever again. I don't intend to stay as Castile or Spain this run. Since every time you form a new tag, you get new missions, but you keep any of the rewards you got from the mission tree. Remember that diplomatic annexation modifier I mentioned from Fecho del Imperio? My modifier stays even if I form a new nation. Same with this mission I just completed, Assemble the Tercios. I will get a new unit type, similar to Janissaries if you've played the Ottomans, it's basically just a better infantry unit. Tethios aren't as good as Janissaries, but they're still better than regular units. With that, the Age of Discovery is coming to an end, and that means this video is too. I plan to chop up this campaign into the four ages so I can go over the tactics I do in an organized fashion. The year is 1526, and the Reformation has come in full force. Here's what I've accomplished. 
Keep in mind that this isn't even as big as I could have gotten had I been a little more proactive. But this much progress is enough to be the number one great power by a long shot. This is a strange world where Castile, rather than colonizing themselves, simply pawned it off on the crown of Portugal, instead becoming a true Mediterranean authority. France has been hamstrung and England is next on the chopping block. The only real rival Castile has is the Ottomans, whose empire will eventually crumble to decadence. We'll have to see where the universal monarchy of Castile goes in the Age of Reformation, but funnily enough, they may end up going to Africa and letting Europe rot in its own religious turmoil. Being a bastion of Catholicism, Castile will be burning a lot of heretics and spreading the faith to the masses of Africa potentially. Or maybe it'll go completely wild and dismantle the empire while it's fighting itself. Who knows? Where would you like to see the empire go in the Age of Reformation? Let me know in the comments. I'm going to start playing the next age pretty much right away, so you got to comment fast. That's the end of the video. Thank you for your time.